AI is coming for your job and soon it's going to take over the world. Well, just kidding. That's not necessarily the case here, but especially in recent weeks, AI has been getting a lot of negative attention thanks to the lawsuits piling up against it. At first, the lawsuit seemed like it was a matter of artists fighting against the machine. PR Newswire reported that three of them, Sarah Anderson, Kelly McKernan, and Carla Ortiz, filed a lawsuit against Stability AI, DeviantArt, and Midjourney due to copyright infringement. DeviantArt, by the way, recently made its own AI art generator called DreamUp, so that's kind of what that's in reference to. Now, according to the complaint, images contained in the Lion dataset were downloaded and used by these generators without compensation or consent from those artists. The three also expressed concern, saying that they had to stick up for their profession and hard work before they were effectively replaced by a machine. Many may argue that, hey, that's not a risk because AI doesn't really have the capability of being original, but do humans really have that ability anymore? Isn't everything out there to some extent derivative of something we already know? Before we get too philosophical here, let's get back to if AI should even be allowed to do something like this in the first place. Frankly, the question of AI being fair use is kind of a tricky one because while anyone can look at a public image with no problem, if they're using it to create another separate image and then profiting from it, is that fair use? Shouldn't these artists be protected by copyright, especially when AI is being trained on their images and in essence, recreating them? Plus, any of the art that AI does create won't have any copyright protection whatsoever either because the US won't give copyright protection to works solely created by a machine. Looking at it from these essential basic angles, the complaints these artists make seem incredibly valid. And it's a bit hard to be sympathetic towards a machine anyway. The lawsuit does have its issues though, and it's been criticized for claiming AI models store images when it isn't necessarily how AI art models even work. As The Verge explains, the software does not piece together bits of images in the form of a collage either, but creates pictures from scratch based on these mathematical representations. As if you can't already tell, AI is a messy, complicated, and anything but straightforward situation. With new technology, whether that's deep fakes, AI, robots, or whatever else it might be, we don't really have a lot of laws in place right now. It's not like the founding fathers envisioned this and said, thou shalt not use images for artificial intelligence without the artist's consent. Like, you know, like it just didn't exist. But things have gotten more intense recently too, now that Getty Images has entered the picture. They recently filed a lawsuit against Stability AI for illegally copying and processing millions of their copyrighted images. Since Stability AI is open source, they're pretty transparent about where their images come from but it's not really like this counts as crediting an artist or photographer either, does it? Since Getty Images is a well-known name with weight behind it, this actually has the possibility of changing and reshaping the AI art industry. Stability AI has already made plans to allow artists to opt out of having their work from the training data set, but this does feel like a weak response in general. Ars Technica says there's currently no way to opt out large groups of images, plus many copies of the same image could be in the data set. Wouldn't it make more sense to opt in as opposed to opting out so that way the burden isn't on the artist? But apparently maybe that just makes too much sense. I don't know. Unfortunately, the artist is getting the short end of the stick and it's a common thread around AI as we'll soon see. And the consequences of the technology being commonplace may be far more severe than AI taking work from just creatives. Hello and welcome to The Corporate Casket. I'm the Illuminati. Now, before we get into some specific examples here, I do briefly want to go over what artists have to say about AI, both the pros and cons, since there are plenty of arguments on each side. On the anti-AI side of the spectrum, you've got those like illustrator Nicholas Cole, who wants AI art banned because he believes art is supposed to be intrinsically human. Personally, I don't think the answer to the controversial AI debate is going to be an all or nothing situation. Computers have already been involved in the creative process for a long time now, and trying to get rid of them altogether or on the other end, abandon an organic human process completely doesn't seem like it's going to be the right answer. One interesting point of view published in The Atlantic is that AI has the ability to democratize art. Mark Chen, the lead researcher on Doll E2, a model from OpenAI, says that a bunch of people who wouldn't necessarily classify themselves as artists can now use image generation easily and essentially take that image they have in their brain and put it on paper. Or, you know, well, a screen and not paper, but I think you get the general idea. 
And this can be a great tool for people, absolutely. But it's not hard to understand why an artist would be concerned after hearing something like that. Someone might as well be telling them, hey, now anyone can be an artist with the click of a button and your years of experience and schooling are obsolete, right? Well, not necessarily. Mark also told the Atlantic's Progress Summit that artists themselves are able to get far more out of AI than a regular user. Quote, and there's a lot of technologies like this. Smartphone cameras haven't replaced photographers. And to some extent, I do get what Mark is trying to say. A good camera doesn't make everyone a photographer after all. But the difference here is that you still need a person to compose the image itself. No one's smartphone is growing legs, directing a model, finding a good lighting angle and snapping the picture, at least not yet anyway. Whereas with AI, you can get the end result, the end product, like an image or an article with the click of a button. That's why I'm not sure I'd consider them an appropriate comparison. And that's why I can understand these artists' concerns in a whole variety of creative fields. Back in August of 2022, Wired covered a story about Swedish artist Simon Stallenhag, who is most known for creating eerie, futuristic landscapes. Apparently, Andres Guadamas used AI to mimic Simon's style, then posted those images to Twitter in order to highlight the legal and ethical questions surrounding AI-generated art. Andres said he chose Simon on purpose because the latter had spoken out against the topic in the past. Though Andres claims he didn't want to upset Simon, naturally, that's exactly what happened. The pair eventually sorted things out and Andres publicly apologized, saying he was trying to make a thought-provoking experiment, not an attack. Wired continued and said, Stalinhag does not like the way new technologies can be set up to enrich already powerful tech companies and CEOs. AI is the latest and most vicious of these technologies, he says. It basically takes lifetimes of work by artists without consent and uses that data as the core ingredient in a new type of pastry that it can sell at profit with the sole aim of enriching a bunch of yacht owners. And I completely understand where Simon is coming from because let's face it, even though ethically, many of us may know not to take artistic credit for what an AI has done and treat it more like a tool or inspiration, the AI itself isn't really taking artistic consent or credit into account. No one asked Simon, hey, are you cool with your landscapes being popped into a generator, let alone the unfathomable multitude of other images that AI can now draw from? RJ Palmer, a concept artist on the movie Detective Pikachu, said that he was particularly upset to see users adding artists' names to a text prompt in order to generate images. He said, when they're feeding work from living, working artists who are, you know, struggling as it is, that's just mean-spirited. He's also actively called it anti-artist and pointed out how you can even see AI trying to recreate artist logos when they mimic a specific style. This does seem to fall outside fair use too because if an AI model is trained on many millions of images and creates a new picture, arguing that it's infringing on your copyright is going to be one hell of a bumpy ride. But as Gervais, a professor at Vanderbilt Law School who specializes in intellectual property law states, if you give an AI 10 Stephen King novels and say, produce a Stephen King novel, then you're directly competing with Stephen King. Would that be fair use? Probably not. Again, using AI as inspiration and a tool is one thing, but claiming or implying I made this thing and directly mimicking someone else when posting the art is another thing. As Gervais noted though, the very definition of fair use is up in the air right now because there's a pending Supreme Court case involving Warhol's use of photographs of prints to recreate artwork. So take note that my comments on fair use today could basically be different tomorrow if the Supreme Court is feeling a little spicy or whatever. But back to what people think of AI generated art. Game developers and other artists have had some more balanced takes. The art director of Telesgrad and Telesgrad 2, all Ivar Rudy, said that he's a bit on the fence. While he sees the appeal and says there's something inherently interesting about AI, the data sets being largely built from unethically sourced material is worrying. Yes, the images could have some fascinating use cases, and I don't see a problem using it for references, mood boards, or assisting art restoration. The end result of all three of these could ideally benefit or uplift a human artist. It's the exploitative nature and the fact that copyright ownership is still a massive unknown that makes people so unsure. Generally speaking, I agree with Rudy's point that artists already struggle. The starving artist stereotype exists for a reason and creative entry-level jobs are important. It's worrying if someone who may normally hire an artist for a commission neglects to do so because they'd rather get a flawed free AI version. If laws around copyright and theft are put in place, then maybe AI can be a great tool and not so much a terrifying one. 
Now that we've got a solid background on what AI is and the debates around it, let's take a look at some specific examples that have made people wary or impressed by AI-generated art. As a general disclaimer here, there's absolutely no way that I could mention every single project involving AI. So here's just a few of the more controversial ones. If I don't mention the particular one you're interested in, and I am sorry, but there are many right now. Now for the first major example, let's take a look at Tor. This may not be a big five publisher, Penguin, Random House, Hatchet, HarperCollins, Simon & Schuster, or Macmillan. But if you're an avid reader, you've probably picked up one of their books before all the same. They've published authors like Terry Pratchett, Brandon Sanderson, Victoria Schwab, and countless others. The point is, they're a big name in books, big enough to pay their artists. Late last year though, Tor found themselves in the center of an absolute mess for using AI to create a book cover and supposedly trying to hide that. Fractal Noise by best-selling author Christopher Paolini revealed its cover, and while plenty thought it looked cool, others said there was something off about it. And as it turns out, this AI generated art that inspired it was posted to a stock art site. And the Fractal Noise cover is almost identical to the AI art, just in a different color. Tor claims that they thought they were licensing an image from a reputable stock house and they had no idea that the image was AI generated. Now, I'm not going to say that this is absolutely impossible, but it feels like a weak argument when a bunch of Twitter users could figure this out rather quickly and a massive publishing house just somehow couldn't. As Gizmodo pointed out, Tor has used incredible illustrators before and they've published gorgeous artworks in their novels. So to replace a beautiful image with an orange tinted AI one feels like a slap of an insult. But let's try and give them the benefit of the doubt first. Maybe they were genuinely unaware that this image came from an AI generator. So what was their reaction to the internet's outcry? Well, it turns out that's actually what has seemed to irritate people the most, their weak apology. Gizmodo said that due to production constraints, they've moved forward with the AI cover and they've championed creators in the SFF or the sci-fi fantasy community and will continue to do so. Yet they've made no promise about not using AI in the future, which has people pretty disheartened as to how apologetic they actually are. Other authors who have been published by Tor, such as John Scalzi, have also given their two cents about the situation. According to Scalzi, he intends to emphasize to Tor and any other publishers that he works with that he wants his covers to be 100% human derived. He's also done with AI art in public settings, stating that it's more important to stand with and support visual artists than it is to show off things I've generated through prompts on social media. This isn't because Scalzi hates AI generated art and actually far from it. But if it's undercutting artists instead of helping them, then yeah, that is a problem. One main point I've heard reiterated over and over is that AI art is supposed to give creative people more time to be creative, more references, and more resources. The Tor book cover does not feel like a turning point. This art could have been created by a person. A human could have made art for fractal noise, even if they did use stock images as a reference. A human would have been involved in the production and used that money to pay bills. Now AI has replaced that person and effectively removed a talented human in the process. Does that mean that AI is replacing artists as a whole? Well, not necessarily, but this does make people uneasy, a feeling made worse when entirely AI written books are now out on the market. And yeah, you heard me correct. If you thought that an AI generated book cover was questionable, well then the book Alice and Sparkle probably should not be on your to read list. Amar Reshi created this children's picture book using Chat GPT and Midjourney in just a few days, published it and started selling it on Amazon. And the just ever so delightful irony in all of this is the story is about a young girl who builds her own AI robot and then learns about how the technology needs to be treated with care as it could be used for good or evil. Plenty of artists would argue that this is a lesson Reshi himself never learned because he had a conversation with a robot to help create the story itself and AI generated art for the illustrations. None of the stories seemed to be purely original human thought. It was just a book created by AI and another artist's work. If Reshi hadn't profited off of it and just shown it to people as an example of what this technology might be able to do, then I think the backlash would be a little bit different. But he sold copies, though only 70 when Time published their article. He earned royalties from that and did so without truly creating anything on his own. It does feel like a new form of plagiarism when seen in this light and not very good plagiarism at that. 
And again, I understand that beauty is subjective and I'm definitely no picture book artist, but the little girl looks strange. Her hands seem to have little spikes or claws at the end of them and the lack of detail in the plants and drawing utensils just make the image look half-assed, not stylized. If this artwork were made by a person, I'd be less prone to criticizing it because we all start somewhere. But does AI not know humans have fingers and not claws? Though I think my favorite description of them that I've seen is flesh spork. Anyway, author Abraham Josephine Reisman had this to say, as somebody who makes my money and finds my joy in writing, it's deeply troubling to see people seeking cheap alternatives to actual human writing, which is already one of the most deliriously underpaid professions. Reshi said that he does hear out these artists and that the tech industry should involve them in the process of creation. The status where Reshi announced he was publishing this book, he prompted OpenAI and Midjourney, asking them how they can ensure protections for artists and how to train models on consent. And while I think it's an admirable sentiment to say that their talent, skill, and hard work needs to be respected, I can understand why artists would also feel like that's exactly what Reshi didn't do by profiting off of these tools. Like if you plagiarize someone, I don't think a subtweet about saying how talented they are is really gonna make up for that. Overall, the reactions have been pretty mixed, though I'm curious what people may have said if Reshi wasn't publishing or selling the book too. But what's just as concerning and potentially even more consequential than the creative jobs though, is what some other professions AI has begun moving in on as well. Take just a few weeks ago, for example, Sina unveiled that they were experimenting with an AI assist to write their articles. They explained that for about two months, the Sina Money editorial team started using the tech to quote, see if there's a pragmatic use case for an AI assist on basic explainers around financial service topics. At the time this January article was released, about 75 articles had been published. Gizmodo pointed out how hypocritical this felt coming from CNET. In December, a full month after the tech had already been utilized, a CNET article was released discussing how human jobs are safe from AI. Reporter Jackson Ryan even said, quote, AI definitely can't do the job of a journalist. To say so diminishes the act of journalism itself. I guess CNET didn't care to point out to their reporter that, hey, AI was in fact writing some of their articles. Sure, they may still have humans editing them, but these do feel like contradictory opinions coming from the same damn company. But is it a horrible, terrible thing if AI writes financial articles? Well, not necessarily. After all, AI can be unbiased and time can be freed up then devoted to research and telling the human side of a story the way a robot simply can't. Plenty of news outlets already use AI too, long before CNET. The LA Times uses it to report on earthquakes and homicides. The Washington Post has an award-winning robot reporting program called Heliograph. Bloomberg News is one of the earliest adapters of automated content with their program Cyborg. And AP News has leveraged AI since 2015. If you ask me, I think one of the reasons people have been hesitant or downright critical of CNET is because CNET didn't disclose that AI was writing some of the articles. Their credit was to CNET money staff and their small dropdown description said that automation technology contributed to the article. Its wording has only been recently changed to say AI engine, FYI. Plus, let's be honest here for a minute, no one likes to think that they might've been fooled by a robot. We've all probably seen some post-apocalyptic movie where robots take over the world and nobody wants to believe that reality might be on the horizon. Just as the internet is now recoiling at the word of CNET using AI, they were doing the same thing back in 2015 with AP News too. According to The Verge, you wouldn't know if an AI was responsible for an article at first blush, and the obvious tell doesn't come until the end of the article. This story was generated by Automated Insights. The whole thing sounds so scandalous in The Verge's publication. The way a newspaper would discuss a woman flashing her ankle to a crowd 200 years ago type of scandal, at least, by the end of it, this article makes the point clear that no, computers are not taking journalist jobs. They're allowing writers more time to, as the assistant business editor of the AP puts it, write smarter pieces and more interesting stories. This, however, has not stopped journalists and researchers from wondering if AI really will become the future of journalism and if they have the potential to get it right. Will these small AI generated pieces of journalism get things accurate? Are they meaningful or insightful or even worth publishing? Will it replace real jobs? Will every article now have to clarify that it was written by a robot or a human at the bottom? Now, I obviously do not have all the answers to this and nobody does right now, but 
things aren't exactly looking great for AI in the journalism department. Literally, as the script was being written, word came out that CNET's article writing AI had been making some pretty careless mistakes. Futurism reported that many boneheaded errors had been made, ones that were either ignored or not caught by the human editing team at CNET. They wrote, take this section in the CNET article, which is a basic explainer about compound interest. To calculate compound interest, use the formula initial balance one plus interest rate over the number of compounding periods by the number of compounding per period X number of periods. For example, if you deposit $10,000 into a savings account that earns 3% interest compounding annually, you'll earn $10,300 at the end of the first year. It sounds authoritative, but it's wrong. In reality, of course, the person that AI is describing would only earn $300 over the first year. It's true that the total value of their principal plus interest would total 10,300, but that's very different from earnings. The principal is money that the investor had already accumulated prior to putting it in an interest bearing account. And again, I will admit, I am not the best math person in the world, which is why I would rather quote an article that explains it as opposed to try and work the numbers out myself. There are several other examples given, some of which are worded poorly, whereas others like the statement, a one-year certificate of deposit only compounds once after the initial deposit reaches maturity are just downright untrue. It could be that the editors thought the AI knew what it was talking about and didn't properly fact check it. Or it could be that these articles are so riddled with errors that it's actually hard to catch all of them. But editors shouldn't be playing Pokemon with CNET if this machine is meant to give more time to devote to important aspects of their work. It clearly is not doing that. But whether for good or for bad, and whether it's book covers, whole books, or a news article, AI seems to be here to stay, at least in some capacity. The Harvard Business Review wrote about generative AI a couple months ago, explaining that these models have a ton of use in marketing applications. Jasper, for example, can make blogs, social media posts, sales emails, ads, and a ton of customer facing content. Need a reliable social media manager? Well, AI might be able to help you there. Are you maybe looking to clone someone's voice to pretend to be a family member and get someone to send you money? Well, AI can help you there too, unfortunately, if you're a scammer. There are also AI generated phishing emails too, or on the other side of things, conversational AI tools that can help you catch scammers. Apparently they provide quote, far better insight of the cyber ecosystem, allowing for predictive detection, threat hunting, and faster interventions. Reshi, as he wrote or generated in the book, Alice and Sparkle was right about one thing. AI does have the power to be used for good or evil, just like any form of modern technology. Still, I'd argue that this one needs to be handled very carefully and with certain guidelines or regulations built in. I'm truly not sure what that's gonna look like yet, but maybe years from now, we'll look back on the Getty Images lawsuit and see it as a catalyst for rules around AI forming. Or maybe, like in far too many corporate casket episodes, we'll be saying that regulators should have seen the writing on the wall far sooner, and now the industry is an absolute mess. But I guess for now, we're just going to have to wait and see. And with that being said, that's where we're going to end today's episode of The Corporate Casket. I hope you learned something new here today. And if you did, make sure that you're liking, following, and subscribing to stay up to date on all the latest episodes. And if you'd like to connect with me outside of this series, please make sure to go to my description box, click on the Linktree link, and it's gonna have all of my social media and current projects that I'm involved in. Again, thank you so much for spending some of your time here with me today. I really do appreciate it. And I'll see you in the next one. Bye.